Hello, my name is Timothy Petitsis. I'm currently serving as the Dean of Hellenic College and as the faculty member of the Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology, responsible for teaching the ethical and social ethical tradition of our church to seminarians. Today I would like to talk to you about the lost meaning of life in the grave. In 2003, I wrote my doctoral dissertation about the social meaning of Holy Week, the week-long series of rituals and readings which seems to be analogous to the old city-founding celebrations of the classical world. The city that is founded in Holy Week is the New Jerusalem, through a wedding liturgy involving the bridegroom, Christ, and his bride, the Church. Thus, all across the week, we find theological ideas carrying social, political, and even economic implications. Holy Week has its roots in the earliest church. Even in New Testament times, Christians commemorated the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Some scholars say that when St. John the Divine opened his revelation with the words, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, he was in fact referring to the vigil held on Pascha, the Lord's day. Since so many of the typologies and readings within Holy Week come from the Old Testament, we might even say that Holy Week has its roots older than the events that occurred in Jerusalem in the first century AD. In general, the body of Orthodox religious rituals that we know as our divine liturgies, our divine services, our hymnography, the readings and prayers, constitute a vast repository of biblical, theological, ethical, historical, historical, and other kinds of knowledge about our faith. I like to call religious ritual the hard drive of the human race, a place more enduring than stone or simple texts where we can store the memories and secrets of human experience across many centuries, always ready to be unpacked by any future generations with the eyes to see. This memory-preserving function of ritual means that as we pray the prayers and hymns of the Church, we will from time to time stumble upon encoded messages, some of them hiding in plain sight, left to us from the deep past. One of the most astounding lost meanings present within Holy Week is to be found right in the central hymns of the most heavily attended Church service of the entire Orthodox Christian year the Good Friday Evening Lamentations. It is here that we may discover what I like to refer to as the lost meaning of life in the grave. The Lamentations are formed of three long stanzas. In order to discover the lost meaning of the first stanza, which begins Izoi and Tafo, or life in the grave, let us begin with the second and then the third stanzas. The second stanza of the Lamentations is headed by the verse, Axionesti megalinin se ton zoodotin, ton entostavro tas hiras ektinanda, ke sin dripsanda to kratos tu ekthru. Truly it is meet to magnify you, the life giver, your hands extended upon the cross and tearing apart the power of the enemy. Scholars of the liturgy will note that the first two words, Axionestin, are a reference to a hymn dedicated to the Virgin Mary. The hymn reads, Axionestinos alithos makaris in se tin theotokon, tinae makariston ke panamomiton ke mitera tu theuimon. Truly it is meet to magnify you, the Theotokos, the ever blessed and all blameless, and the mother of our God. According to holy tradition, this hymn was conveyed directly by the Archangel Gabriel to a monk on Mount Athos in the 10th century. It was not written by any human being. Therefore, oxyonistine is not a phrase that can be lightly transferred to, to another person. In fact, the Archangel said, this is a hymn we angels pray in heaven to honor the mother of God. And he wrote them into stone with his finger so that there would be no confusion as to the words. In other words, here in the second stanza of the Lamentations, we are looking at a hymn to the Virgin Mary, now repurposed to praise the salvific burial of Christ. Let us now look at the third stanza, whose first verse reads, E yenea pase, imnon titafisu, 
prosferosi Christemu. Every generation, O my Christ, offers a hymn at your tomb or to your burial. But these words are themselves an obvious reference to chapter 1, verse 48 of the Gospel of St. Luke. There, under the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Virgin Mary prophesied that every generation, Pasa Eyene, will call her blessed. The verse reads in Luke, Idu garaputunin makarius yime pasa eyene. Again, she's testifying that every generation or all generations will call her blessed. So likewise, in this stanza of the Lamentations, we see words intended for the praise of the Mother of God redirected in a poignant praise to the burial of her son. To repeat, both the second and third stanzas of, stanzas of the Lamentations begin with hymns where angelic or spirit-filled words that are meant for the Mother of God are being redirected to the burial of her son. Among other things, this tells us who is speaking in these hymns. For the most part, the Virgin Mary herself, for absolutely no one else would have the authority to redirect her divinely appointed titles. But this must mean that the author of the Lamentations wants us to ask, what of the first verse of the first stanza, Izoe and Tafel, how does this stanza refer to the Virgin Mary in a spirit-filled and holy way? We can answer this with the Bible of the earliest church, the Septuagint, the LXX, or Greek Old Testament. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, we see Adam naming his wife, who has just emerged from his side. But in the Greek Old Testament, Adam does not call her Eve or Eva, but rather Zoe. Zoe otiafti miter pandon ton zondon. He called her life, for she was the mother of all living beings. And so the poetic structure of the Lamentations guides us to see the lost meaning of life in the grave. As in the second and third stanzas, the first stanza begins with a title which is attributed to the Mother of God whenever we refer to her as the New Eve and turns this title to Christ and to his sacred burial. If you look at the Apolitikion for the Dormition of the Mother of God on August 15th, you will notice the same idea. Twice in the hymn, the word Zoe is used, meant also to evoke this sense that the Mother of God both accepts her title of New Eve and yet then transfers this title to her son, the true Zoe, the true life. The Doxastikon of the Dormition plays with this title of New Eve for the Virgin Mary in a similar way. Once we see that the Zoe in Izoe and Tafo functions as a title for the Virgin Mary, which she herself then reassigns to Christ, multiple meanings open up in this simple phrase. Of course, there is the obvious meaning, which we all see. Zoe equals life equals Christ. Christ is life himself lying in the grave. And by continuing to be life, even as he lies in the grave, we see a second mean, meaning. Izoe and Tafo already announces the resurrection. We are not just mourning Christ's death, but already announcing his defeat of death. Thirdly, we see in this short hymn the fact that our own loved ones now lying in the grave are joined there in the tomb by Christ, who gives them a foretaste of the resurrection now and who gives them the promise of bodily resurrection in the age to come. But the meaning of this phrase, Izoe and Tafo, is pregnant with still further significance. Izoe and Tafo is meant to say that the Virgin Mary is giving away her title as the new Eve and saying, no, Christ is the real Zoe. And Izoe and Tafo shows the whole economy of God, all of salvation history. From the fall of the first Zoe, Adam and Eve together, into sin and death, to the purity of the new Eve, Panaia, to the death of Christ, the ultimate Zoe, to the resurrection, and to the resurrection of all at the last judgment. All of that is contained in one simple phrase of two nouns, a preposition, and an article. All of salvation is present in those few words, all of salvation history. Sixthly, 
This phrase means that the Virgin Mary sees herself as lying in the grave with Christ, and perhaps that Izoe and Tafel refers to her in the grave, and that perhaps that like any loving mother, she wishes she could have died in his place. And finally, placed as these hymns which mark the founding of the New, New Jerusalem, we must see certain social and political meanings. We are meant to learn from all the hymns of this massive socio-religious observance called Holy Week, how to conduct ourselves in society and in the church as a social setting. Somehow, izoi and tafo means most of all that poignant chiasm, which is grief, where the living person sees their dead relative as somehow still alive and feels themselves to be somehow dead. And so the Virgin Mary, faced with the trauma of her son and God's torture and death, sees herself, though still alive, as somehow already in the grave. And she sees her son, though dead, as really life itself. It is just like when we pray the Jesus prayer and call ourselves the sinner or the chief of sinners. This means not only that we are sinful, but that we will, that we will to unite ourselves with Christ at his most vulnerable point on the cross. In the Jesus prayer and in, in the noetic and hesychastic tradition of the church more generally, we attempt to unite ourselves to Christ as he became sin for the life of the world. A few decades back, there was a clever saying that went, if you aren't part of the solution, you are a part of the problem. This saying is, has a certain validity, but it remains a worldly saying appropriate for an activist age that often involves meddling in other people's business, often with unintended negative side effects. It is a saying that fits perfectly the century past in which so many social activist ideas had unintended and really disastrous consequences. In the church, we have a different saying, we might say, even more clever than that of the 1960s. We might say, if you aren't the whole problem, then you're just part of the problem. In other words, when we repent, we repent not only for our own sins, but on behalf of all the generations past, all those now alive, all those generations yet to come. Because if we can't trace most of the ills of the world to some movement of our own hearts, we deceive ourselves. It is our lusts, our anger, and our prideful intellectualism, which combine with those of all others, and perhaps combine in the decisive way, to introduce great sins and scandals in the world. It's time to see that for this kind of total self-offering, Izoe and Tafo points to the Virgin Mary in just this sense. The Lamentation hymns were written most likely in the 13th century, perhaps by a metropolitan from the island of Rhodes. This was a very difficult century for the church. These were the years when the city was under, the city of Constantinople was under a plundering 57 year long Phoenician occupation. And yet here we are in the 21st century, still discovering and uncovering the messages these hymns have carried, hidden in plain sight all these eight centuries. I hope this meditation encourages you to attend all the services of Holy Week, seeking the meanings hidden and plain, which can revolutionize our souls and our prayer for the world. How are we to react when we see Christ lying in the grave on Good Friday? By seeing how life himself deceives death by filling the grave with life. By seeing how the total history of human error and sin led to the sacrifice of Christ's own life. And lastly, by imitating the purity of his mother, who not only gave him life, but would have, if she could have, died with him or in place of him. Thank you.